Good morning and welcome to Rosedale Community Church with our online message. In the lead up to Christmas, we are today looking at what it means for God to become flesh, for Emmanuel, God with us here on earth. When I, um, when I lived in Belfast, which is quite a few years ago now, <laughs> when I lived in Belfast, I was living and working on an estate in South Belfast, many of you know this story, um, which was a small Protestant estate completely surrounded by big Catholic estates and a 12-foot fence. And I moved in, um, I moved in there in 98, so it was after the kind of the Good Friday Agreement, but there was still troubles around. And as I'm moving in, I look out my window and see the soldiers patrolling along my house with the with their um you know with their rifles and patrolling around there and uh, i was in my early 20s and quite frankly most of them were in their early 20s as well and um it was a full circle because it reminded me of those years ago when my dad in his early 20s met with god very powerfully on that estate that I was now back in sharing the love of Jesus. And whilst I was there and just moved in, I, um, we found out that the, that the next lot of soldiers that were coming in, the next rotation, was going to be from the Green Howards. The Green Howards Regiment, which is the regiment my dad belonged to. And uh, oh, I thought this was fantastic. And one of the things that they did when they moved into the area was that they would invite community leaders to come and meet with them. This was peacekeeping at this time. They wanted to get to know the community, the community leaders. And so this was so exciting. Um, we, I got an invitation to, to go and meet one evening with the Green Howards Regiment to visit their barracks and see where they were. And oh, honestly, this was, you know, I was absolutely tickled pink about this. And I, you know, phoned my dad and said, Dad, Dad, I'm going. He said, brilliant. He said, but remember, Bethany, you can't actually tell anybody who you are because that would make me you know, a target, and I would be dangerous there. And he said, and you can't, he said, I know, he said, I don't think, he said, I don't think now, he said, it's been so many years, you won't run into anybody there who knew me, he said, but you, you better not, you know, keep your name. When I lived there, I used my mother's maiden name, Barrett, rather than my name of Burridge. I said, no worries, Dad, I'll, I'll you know, I'll make sure, you know, I won't say anything, I won't let them know um, who I am, just in case. But I got there and, um, and we got talking and um, one of Dad's friends had just brought out a book. So he'd written a book about his time in the army and then the secret service, kind of, not that secret, one of the non, not so secret secret services. <laughs> and he'd written this book. But in this book was the stories about where he was there in the 70s in Belfast and he was part of my dad's platoon. So my dad was referred to in this book, and this book had just come out, and we were there at the Green Howards, and they were talking about it, and I was trying so hard not to say, you know, who I was or anything, but my dad's name came up, and uh, this is one of the photos of my dad at that time, and um, him all dressed up, and his name came up, and there was one of the older officers there who said, oh yeah, I knew him. I knew him. I was like, this is really cool, this is really great. And um, I can say, yeah, I know him too. Um, he said, yeah, yeah, I knew. I knew Cliff Burridge. Oh, Cliff Burridge. Oh, he was a really hard man. You wouldn't want to mess with Cliff Burridge. He said, <laughs> Cliff Burridge, he said, he said, actually, I was on the boxing team with him. And um, we all knew Cliff Burridge. He held some awards and he broke a few records and um, and he said he could have gone professional they were they were looking to him they wanted him to go professional and he could have done this and they were actually looking and asking if he'd do that and then um, they were looking at wanting him to go into um, uh, you know do the Olympics and things like that you know boxing because he was so good but he wasn't interested in that he wanted to be a soldier you know so he wanted to run around and you know deal with riots and you know with it with his with his rife and he was like yeah yeah you, you didn't you didn't mess with Cliff Burridge he was a hard man and um, and of course as all of you know um, <laughs> and would have known my dad Cliff 
by the end of his life, yeah, he wouldn't, you wouldn't have described him as a hard man, would you? He was a man of grace. He was a man of love. He would bend over backwards to help people. At his funeral, there were so many there, and so many other young guys, actually, who came and was like, he was a dad to me. And I was like, I know, he was so good at being a dad. Because there on the streets of Belfast one day, his life was changed, changed completely as he met with God. And we think of lives changed. The Bible is full of life-changing stories, isn't it? You know, we think of, you know, I've, I've, I've always um, often thought my, you know, my dad's experience of meeting God and completely changing his life is very much like Paul's. Paul's experience of Saul to Paul, you know, he was persecuting, he was a hard man, he was violent, until he met Jesus, until he met God and he changed. You know, we think, don't we, of Moses and how he changed as he met God. I even think of my favourite character of the lot, you know, the Apostle Peter, you know, and his impetuousness, his, you know, um, sticking his foot in it all the time, you know, what he would do, running around here, denying Jesus, and then how he changed, how he changed. As remarkable as those are, though, what I think is the most incredible change is the account of how God himself changed, the change that he took on himself willingly at this time of Christmas. We're going to read about it. If you've got your Bibles, turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14 to 18. John, chapter 1, says this. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace, in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with God has made him known. Isn't this wonderful? Such a fantastic truth. And this morning we are looking at the Saviour, the Saviour made flesh, the Saviour incarnate the saviour and I think this is of all the changes I mean I mean this is the most mind-boggling this is the mystery how did God the fullness of all God become a human as limited as we are I mean just just feel yourself okay just feel yourself and how small you are you know, how small and soft, you know, and fragile you are. You know, just, just think, look at the person next to you and kind of, you know, poke them, and, you know, and say, look, 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 you're, 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 just, you're just you. You're just you. Okay, when, when God came, when God came as Jesus, he, he was all of God. And yet he came into a body like ours. You know, we, we, we see this, and this is written here and, and, and written so many times, you know, in verse 18. No one has seen God. God is so big. He's so powerful. You know, it dates back to Genesis when before the creation of the world, God was there. He was a spirit hovering over the waters and no one could see him. Moses dared to ask God, I want to see you face to face. And God said, well, you can't. You simply can't. If you see me face to face, you, you won't live because I am so holy. I am so big. I have so much, so much in me 
You won't see me. You can't see me and live. And yet, God wanted us to see him. God wanted us to see him. And so we have the word became flesh. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word, what are we talking about? The word, this is, it doesn't, it doesn't translate very well into, into our language, okay? The Greek is logos, and the Greek logos we find in words like biology. Got that? Yeah? Psychology, the ology bit. Okay, which if you, I mean, a literal translation means the words about those things, okay, or the study of those things, or the knowledge of those things, or the communication about that. So biology is the words or the study or the communication about life, okay, how life happens. Um, you know, so the, the logos, this word, is the, is the communication, the expression, the knowledge, the words that come. The words that all of God is, the, Jesus is the word of God. He's the one who comes and shows us who God is. He speaks, doesn't he? Jesus said this. I speak only, only the words of my Father. I will communicate with you. I will tell you. I mean, we think also, and I can't, you know, this comes to mind because we have this, um, where, one, where John starts at the very beginning. In the beginning was the word. And we think back to Genesis. In the beginning. And we think how God created the entire universe by speaking. Let there be light. And there was. The word was spoken out. And the universe came into being. And that's what John is trying to say here in our limited language. This amazing mystery of God. All of who God is and was. That word, let there be light, the creativeness. The, the all that there is to say. To say, he came in flesh. He came in a person. He is the God of the universe. You might remember that when Job, when Job was asking God, God, I don't understand why am I hurting so much? You know, why this suffering? Why is all this um, happening? And, God, uh, and Job questioned God. The way that God spoke to Job was in the bigness of his creation. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid the cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I set limits for it, when I said, this far you may come and no further, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning? or shown the dawn its place. And so God goes on. And it was this God, this power of all creation, who came to be born as a baby. It was the God who is so big, who stretches out his mighty hand, that set the ten plagues on Egypt. It's the God who brought the Israelites across the Red Sea and led them through the wilderness in pit, fire and smoke. It was the God who took them into the promised land, winning battles. It was the God who brought miraculous healings, who sent the prophets. It's this God 
amazing God who humbles himself, limits himself, and becomes a human baby. A baby. Oh, babies are so cute, but they are remarkably vulnerable. I mean, they are. They just lie there and feed and poop. <laughs> Don't they? You know, they, 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 they actually can't, they can't talk, can they? They can't communicate much except to say, yeah, can I, can I have some more food, please? And my nappy's dirty again, change it. Give me hugs. That's the extent of their communication through cries and grisliness. And yet, and yet a baby arrives and don't we all gaze in awe and wonder at a baby? You know, their very arrival, their existence is so powerful because they demonstrate the miracle of love. And it was into that tiny, vulnerable baby that God poured himself that we have the mystery of Emmanuel, God with us, God with us. We've just sung, haven't we, that beautiful carol, Mary, did you know? Did you realise, Mary, that when you held that baby, who he would grow up to be? What I think is incredible is there in the Garden of Eden, God made us humans in his likeness. And then, all those years later, he became one. He became one. He became one. Colossians 1 verse 19 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that's Jesus, and through Jesus to reconcile to himself God all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. To have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus. That's kind of mind-boggling, isn't it? Mind-boggling, because we know that God is spirit and can be omnipresent. Actually, Jesus couldn't be. He was limited by his flesh. He could only be in one place at one time. So what is it that is there, all of this fullness revealed in Jesus? Well, it's the essence. It's everything that God is. It's his love. Think of your favorite stories of where Jesus showed God's love to those around him. It's his compassion his care. It is, of course, his holiness. His holiness was shown in Jesus because Jesus was the only man without sin. The only one. In Jesus, we see the sense of righteousness and justice and moral certitude. Certainty that was found in God is found in Jesus. I mean, you read there how he was infuriated with the Pharisees. Wasn't he in their hypocrisy? He never condoned sin or tricking other people. Yes, when sinners came to him, he would absolutely turn on them his grace and forgiveness and love. But then he would say, off you go. I don't sin anymore. Why? Because he believed in righteousness and justice. His desire was for people to know the Father. He was always pointing his people heavenward. He would say, hey, the kingdom of heaven has come. Do you not know that the heaven is like this and the kingdom of God is like this? Do you not know the Father? My father and your father. He would speak of the father. And by doing that, he had such a longing for people to be part of his family. Come, he always said. Come into the family of God. Come. Come, let us worship the father together. It is Jesus who in doing all the miracles, in doing all the wonders... In riding into Jerusalem on a donkey of dying and rising from the dead proves that God is God, that God is King. 
And yet he did this. Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 says about Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Do you remember when Satan took him up to the high, to the top of the temple and said, if you jump off here, you know, uh, God will save you, he'll, you know, he'll send his angels to save you. And um, actually, yeah, yeah, Jesus could have done that. He was God. He could have commanded the angels. And yet he knew that there was a far, far more important principle. And that is, as he turned and said to Satan, you don't test the Lord your God. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to claim my e equality with God to prove to you, Satan, how big I am. He said, I'm not going to do that. He said, no. He didn't use it to his own advantage. Rather, verse 7 to um, Philippians chapter 2, rather he made himself nothing. And by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. He humbled himself. He humbled himself even to the point of giving up his life. It was a horrific death excruciatingly painful and humiliating. We read that actually at least three times he was stripped naked and he certainly was to be hung up there on the cross and hung up in public where everybody could see his torn body. It was a terrible death and Jesus did that because he loved us, because he knew that that's why he had to be here. But but just follow with me this thought for a moment. If dying on the cross was all that Jesus needed to do when he came to earth, you know, I, I reckon he could have planned this differently. Okay? I mean, yes, he would have to do something that would sufficiently anger the Romans for him to be killed. But I don't believe that dying was his only goal. It was a main goal and he needed to do it. But I don't believe that dying was his only goal. I believe that living as the son of God here, God become flesh was equally important. Living and showing us the father. Back in John chapter one, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us demonstrating the kingdom of God was vital. Demonstrating. He needed people to see the relationship that he had with God and that therefore they could have with God. He needed to gather the 12 and the 70 and the 120 who would have witnessed and seen him and lived with him so that they could go and tell others about him. This, this best friend thing that he had going with his disciples, knowing that they would too follow his example and give up their lives for the kingdom was essential. If you look at that, verse 18, we've mentioned it and referred to it already. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with God, has made him known. How did he make him known? He made him known by, by demonstrating the kingdom, by healing by setting people free, by preaching the gospel, by drawing people into a relationship with him. And you think, what is a close relationship? How do you know when you're close with someone? You know their favourite colour, their food, 
What makes them laugh? You hear their voice coming down the street and you recognise it. There's a jacket lying around and you can tell it's them because it smells like them and you know their smell. You know their character. You know a really close friend, somebody who's there, you know, has those moments when you just know what the other person's thinking, don't you? You know, you don't have to say anything, you just have to catch their eye and you know, yeah, I'm thinking the same as you're thinking. You're on the same wavelength. You've got each other's back. We use the word love, but uh, that's, not, that's not really adequate, is it? It's actually something so much thicker. Thicker than that. They get you. And you get them. And that's, what, that's the relationship that, God, that Jesus had with his father. That's what he had. He knew God. God knew him. He was God. It was so close. In complete relationship. And he said, watch me. Look at me. Have this kind of relationship with me. Because I'm going to make him known. And Jesus came that we could have that relationship. That unconditional loved relationship. We are loved, aren't we? And we are valued. We have a meaning and purpose in our life because of him. We're here to worship and adore him and to share his love with others. In Jesus, because of who he is, our relationship with him, because he died and came alive again and said, I'm offering this new life to everybody who follows me. He's our hope. Because he's our hope, we have a strength both in this life and a home for the future. We can know that those who, are, who, have, who we have loved and have gone to be with the Lord are with him. And our hope is that we will go, be there also bowing the knee, proclaiming Jesus as Lord with them in heaven. So we come back to Christmas. Christmas, it's not just about remembering the story of a baby being born and laid in a manger. But it is that. But it's that because it's the celebration of the long-awaited Messiah. It was the moment when the glory of God came to earth. It's the reminder this season that we need to recenter our hearts and minds on knowing the God who knows us. It's a recognition that the birth of Jesus began what we can know every day of our lives, our relationship with the living God. And so we're here, aren't we, again in worship, we're seeing beyond the tinsel and the lights, beyond the ridiculous crowded shops and the way too much food. We're seeing beyond all of that. We're seeing beyond the hype, all the legends and myths that go with it. We're seeing beyond that to the one who was born to be the all of God, all of God among us, so that we could relate to him, so we could see him and see the Father, so that the one who was born into human flesh can also give us new life, that the Spirit of God can live in us. We've said that the fullness of God was portrayed in Jesus. The wise men saw that, as did the shepherds. So did Simeon and Anna the prophet. Mary and Joseph all witnessed that in this baby was a miracle. The miracle of the fullness of God who would be shown to the whole world. 
just wondering, is there, is there a miracle that you might need this Christmas? Is there some way that you need to see? Need to see again the fullness of God? That you need to say, Lord Jesus, I just, I just want to fix my eyes on you. I want this to be a Christ-centered Christmas. Where, Father? Father, I see you and who you really are. And so, Father, I pray. I pray, God, that as, as, as we see you and as we're going to sing now this last song, crying out to you the fullness of the fullness of God in Jesus. That where we need a miracle, God, you will work that in our lives. Where we need to see you afresh, God, do that. God, those of us among, those of us here who need some hope right now, God, will you show just what a sign of hope your birth is? Father, those of us who need to know your peace and your love, because it's actually been a really difficult time. God, that we will open our hearts to the Lord God who promises love and peace and joy. We come humbly before you and say to you be all glory and honour. In you, Jesus, was displayed all glory and honour. And Jesus, we can't, we can't live without you in our lives. We can't do it. We don't want to do it. We want to be in relationship with you. As we hand our lives over to you as we focus on you work in power today in us and through us and from us out to others in jesus name we pray amen, amen. <clears throat> we are going to stand and we're going to have this last song it's a beautiful song you're going to enjoy singing it it's one of our favorites and as we do, let's use this as a response to reach out to God. Okay, reach out to God and ask him for the miracle that you need, for the fullness of him in your life. Mm -hmm.